So this is important. I am standing next to the future of ham radio. I'm serious about this. Many people have told me this is where we are going to be going, especially if we want any young people in ham radio. Let's see who this future is. Who are you? Hi, I'm Chris Testa, KD2BMH. You've been on ham radio now before, but in, in, at a Tapper conference, you, you've been uh, just kind of talking to an audience. Here you are talking to my audience. Yeah, that's right. Hi, everybody. So this is going to be cool. This guy, we've had more of this guy than we can stand. <laughs> I'm surprised to be on the air again, Bruce Perrin's K6BP. And what we are here to talk about is what what you were describing to me when I talked to you on, uh, not Skype, on um, a, Google. Go a Google Hangout, yeah, yeah. Uh, a couple of, about a month or so ago, mm -hmm. uh, your new product. Yes, we're talking about the HT of the Future's first component, which is white box, which is essentially a radio modem. And it has internal to it a microprocessor running Linux and a gate array. It is very low power because the gate array uses flash instead of SRAM. And it's got a whole radio, which Chris has designed all of this. Yeah, I'm going to say you're, you're the big mouth, but Chris is doing all the work. Chris is doing the work on this one, but I'm a systems programmer. And I do some programming for this, which will start popping up in its suit. Okay, so is it a software hardware, or are you doing a lot of the software too? I'm doing the software on the uh, of the modem itself on the so the FPGA code and all the code on the ARM processor. I've been writing that, and then Bruce is working on the FreeDB server that will run on the application processor. We'll get into the the difference there, and that will be communicating with the radio transceiver and we'll let you do you know, free DV or whatever else you want. Okay, so I'm gonna have to cross my arms here a little bit as you can pick that up and show me what you got. Yeah, so I think the first thing to show really is um, the fact that inside of your cell phone, there's, there's two parts. There's the application processor and then there's the baseband modem. And the application processor is the thing that you interact with. And that's a really solved problem. Right here I have this kit that comes from Texas Instruments called the AM335X starter kit. And yeah, so what's important about it is this whole time we've been talking, it's been asleep, and you can just touch it and wake it up. And this is what happens with your phone in your pocket. Most of the time, it's completely off. It's in a sleep mode. And then you interrupt it, and it can wake back up really quickly and shut back off. So and That's how you save the battery. That's how you save the battery. So. The other part is the baseband modem. So in your phone, you have like a Qualcomm Gobi modem. Uh, and that's of course talking, I do. And that's talking to the cell networks. There's only two or three companies. I have a Verizon. I don't know what you... <laughs> it probably has a Qualcomm Gobi modem in it, but it could be from Intel as well. There's only two or three manufacturers that make chips that talk to cell networks. Yeah, what you need to understand is I am the epitome of the appliance operator. I'm the king of the appliance operators. You're speaking Klingon to me, but some of the folks out there know what you're talking about. Sure. So, it, I, I mean, in your radio, your, you know, your HT, there's something, the transceiver that is, you know, talking to the repeater or talking to, you know, another HT. And what I wanted to do was, uh, you know, kind of take that low power version of the HT, you know, modem or radio, whatever you want to call it, and pair it with a traditional Android touchscreen interface. So that's what I did. This is the actually the second version that I built. This is the, um, the transceiver itself. Uh, and this is the circuit board that I built. And it operates from 50 megahertz to 1,000 megahertz. This is a software-defined radio. Yeah, it's, it's a software-defined radio. There's, there's actually two types of software-defined radios. One called a direct conversion software-defined radio. And that's, that's what Flex is doing now in their new systems. Right, that's what Flex has. And then there's a, what's called, what I call an analog quadrature software-defined radio. And there's this special chip that is a quadrature transceiver. And this one chip lets you has a full transmitter and a full receiver inside of it. And it uses the same sort of math as you would in a software-defined radio. It's called I and Q, or quadrature. And so with that, the magic is that 
you can define any type of waveform that you want. So you can make single sideband, you can make AM, you can make FM, all the different modes, any soft modem mode that you would like, things that I haven't even imagined. So, but what's important about using the quadrature modulator is that it's much, much lower power than, you know, getting the most expensive digital analog converter that you can buy and running it as fast as you can. Which is why Flex is not making a handy talkie yet. That's, that's correct, yeah. So, so it's a different kind of architecture, but the effect is still the same, that the communication channel is completely defined by software. So, and what was starting to make that important is now we are seeing, um, and over the past couple of years, a splintering of digital voice on ham radio on VHF, UHF. We've got D-Star started things, we've got uh, DMR, Moto Turbo, now yesu has got something coming out. And, I mean, on the one hand, there's something to be said about that. These manufacturers are now saying, yes, ham radio digital voice is a thing. It's not just a, you know, a dream, it's a thing. Mm -hmm. But everybody's going a different direction. This is going to allow some integration, if I'm correct. So, Gary, DMR is an app on this platform. It's not a piece of hardware that you buy. You buy this, and it will run any modulation, any protocol that you like. And then if you want to run DMR, that's actually an Android app that you run on Android, and it's a soft modem that talks to Chris's radio board. And, and speaking of apps, that's something else it, it sounds like you're aiming for, is more smartphone-ish than handy talkie ish Right, yeah, so I think, you know, to bring y the youth into ham radio, if you look at young kids, they're all playing with their parents' iPads. They expect that they can just touch it and see it and manipulate it with their fingers. And they're not ready to tune a turning dial and, you know, listen to, you know, see where a signal is. So I think that we need to, you know, put like a pan adapter on it and, you know, let people swipe across the spectrum and see what's happening and then zoom in on what they, you know, the signal that they want and have it filter down and, you know, just kind of bring using a radio into the 21st century. That's really heavy. The age of knobs has passed. Maybe the title of the show. I'm not sure. So, um, where do things stand now? What what is what can this do, and and how soon might we see something come next? Sure. So, about six weeks ago, I got the transmitter fully operational and heard my voice come through using single sideband on another radio, which I was jumping up and down because it's been a few years that I've been working on this. Uh, the The plan now is to keep improving the noise. And because this is my first radio design, so there's a lot of pieces to understand and to evolve. Are you doing this full time or is this still a hobby project on the weekends? I, I'm a software engineer by trade and as a consultant, I can, or as a contractor, I can, you know, work for a few months, get, load up my coffers and then work on this for a few months. So that's kind of what I've been able to do. I'm coming off of a number of months where I've worked solely on this to finish getting the transmitter working. I still have to finish bringing up the receiver, but you know, things are, things are looking good. All right, and you intend to make this a, a commercial product of some sort? Eventually, yeah. I mean, it, building a radio platform takes years. And you know, Tapper's been very, very helpful in getting me connected with the right people like Bruce and uh, different RF engineers all over the world who've given me advice, given me board reviews, schematic reviews. So uh, it still needs to evolve some time, I think, inside of the, the you know, kind of early adopter crew. But yeah, you can expect us to come out with something that looks like an HT but, or an acts like an HT, but has an Android touchscreen on it. Now, do you guys want to be the, the manufacturer? You want to become an ICOM or a Yesu or something? Or do you expect to spin this off into a bigger company to sell it off? Well, my scheme is for this to be for radio amateurs and open source and open hardware platform and for Land Mobile to be a commercial platform. And I have changes in licensing that will make that work for us economically. So the idea is that the commercial market pays for us to develop things that for hams are open, and the hams develop new apps and we move those to the commercial market. 
Now, if you remember Heartbleed just a couple of weeks ago, Heartbleed was open source where people got the open source and they could use it and they didn't have to give anything back. And that's actually why Heartbleed happened, because no one was paying for its maintenance. So what we're planning to do is dual licensing, where the open guys get it open and the commercial guys pay money and that pays for the maintenance of this software. What, what is the status right now, very sneaky by the way, <laughs> uh, what is the status right now of FreeDV and Codec 2? FreeDV is getting a new modem and that is still probably about half a year away. David Rowe is a real rocket scientist and he is designing a modem which is actually much more like SSB than any digital system so far, where a common digital modem has the same amplitude all the time. It puts the same power into silence that it puts into speaking. This one actually uses less power when you're not talking. So the waveform looks like compressed SSB, but if you tune across it without the codec, you won't be able to understand what's happening. The effect of that is that we're no longer operating your rig in FSK mode. We're operating it in SSB mode and it doesn't run so hot so we can use all of the power that it has. So that's the primary advantage, just some more efficiency from the transmitter. Is there a signal advantage or noise advantage? There is indeed. We're going to have a 4 dB signal over noise operating point, which is lower than we have now. So you'll be able to go farther and have better copy than we have currently. Other technical changes are there are eight carriers where right now we have 15 and that changes something called peak over average power in your favor. And there is soft lock. So right now, with most digital modems, it's either locked or it's unlocked. This one is locked or half locked or third locked or zero locked. So what happens is when it thinks it's getting errors, it will make the voice a little lower and it will bias the signal towards consonant sounds more than vowel sounds. So when you get real bad copy, the operator will sound as if they're mumbling. The point there is it won't just go in and out. It has graceful degradation. And it won't blow you out of your seat with beep and you know all the really strange things that that, that garble can end up with. It'll just kind of blah, 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 blah. Well, that's actually really bad in D-Star, much worse than anything I've ever heard come out of Codec 2. And yeah, we yeah, You should see my wife when, when D-Star decides to hit one of those high notes. Uh, you know, all those numbers add up to the loudest, highest pitch note that D-Star can make. And she looks at me, oh, do I get the stink eye? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, why does that have to happen? There's something going wrong in the software space. And one of the things that we can do that D-Star can't do is we own the whole stack. We own the radio and all of the software, including the codec and the firmware. Now, D-Star, ICOM doesn't actually know how the AMBI codec works. And thus, they can't fix problems like that. Those problems have to be fixed in the DVSI chip behind closed doors by people who maybe we can't convince to fix that because it's still happening to D-Star 10 years after it started. Well, we'd all have to put new chips in our radios and I don't think it's designed to do that. Well, I don't think that we'll have to put codec chips in our radios again. That's the good thing that's happening here is you know, you used to buy a radio, and that radio is cast in concrete. It will always have the features that it had the day you bought it. The end of that is here with these software radios that run apps. They will be running what you want to run 10 years from now, not what they came with. Sounds great. Where is a good place to go? People are going to want to find out more and track the progress of this before we do another show about it. So where are places to go that people can do that? So for, for the White Box project, I have a website called radio.testa.co. 
and there I have all the documentation and there's a mailing list if you're interested in uh, early adopting hardware you can get on my mailing list and you'll be the first to know when we do do a manufacture and uh, and then I also have a, a Facebook page for the white box project and for free DV so freedv.org f r e e d v dot o r g and by the way when he says all the documentation that means enough to make one <laughs> if you're ambitious yeah if, if you're ambitious or crazy but the point is it's open hardware and you can see what's going on in our project. Uh, indeed, David Rowe is making another project, which is a mic, a speaker mic that runs free DV. And he also uploaded all the schematics in the PCB diagram. And I just downloaded it without telling him and had suggestions for changing chips. And that's the kind of thing we like to see in the community. A speaker mic that does free DV. So our, our, one of the, I don't know, issues with free DV is you had to tie up a computer sitting next to your radio. It was not going to be something you would want to do mobile. The speaker mic has everything built in, and now you're doing digital voice on HF with no computer attached? Yes, the speaker mic is actually the computer. It only runs this one application. And we expect it to cost about $200. And it plugs into an FM or a SSB radio and sends digital voice over them. I think it makes more sense over SSB because F FM is quiet already and it makes pretty little sense to put quiet over quiet. Um, when we put digital voice on VHF and UHF, we're going to do it in a way that has much less bandwidth than FM. But anyway, this speaker microphone will be all that you need to run free DV on an SSB radio, and there won't be a computer in the room. And when you want to run SSB, you just flick a switch, and when you want to run free DV, you flick it the other way. Um, and this will be as upgradable as anything else? You know, you come up with a new scheme for free DV, just download it into the mic? So it's open source and open hardware. You can make it run something else than free DV, if you wish. And you can, uh, using USB, just drag a file over to it, and that's the firmware. I'm impressed. This, this is the future of ham radio. I mean, I, I'm not kidding, right? I think so, yeah. That's why I'm doing it. Okay, and David's project is called Smart Mic. Uh, if you write me, Bruce at Perrins.com, you can uh, get the information. Pretty soon we'll have more hardware to show you. I think the uh, Tapper DCC, which is in Austin in September, will be a good time to do that. And certainly people who can get to Austin are going to see a lot of interesting things.